Aloha again, and thanks to those who watched uh, part one of this program, uh, Impunity in the Nuclear Age. So here's part two. It deals with a lot of different subjects, and I, I'd like to try and do a, a little summary right now to bring it into the current day. Um, really, in this segment, we're talking about international law, and, and international law, quite frankly, has become an open joke, really. Uh, obviously, we had the invasion of Iraq, where we know for a fact now, there's no disputing it, everybody should have been more aware back in 2003 when that invasion and occupation began, but now we know weapons of mass destruction was an outright lie, it wasn't a mistake, it was an intentional lie to manipulate us. We know a lot of things, uh, such as Oded Yunan's strategy for Israel in the 1980s, which identified target number one in that long-standing plan as Saddam Hussein. Well, they achieved that goal. That's not a failure. Uh, Iraq is not a failure. It's a success in that regard. International law, in the meantime, has sat by and watched while the whole world could see what apparently they can't, which is the war crimes and crimes against humanity committed by the United States primarily, but its partners, uh, England as well, and uh, other European nations in the invasion and occupation of Iraq. The millions and millions of refugees uh, that we see coming into Europe are a direct result of that. That's not an accident either. That's all by design to pit us against each other and feed the divide and rule stratagem, which is at the heart, at the very core of the New World Order agenda of the powers that be. Uh, we also see millions of orphans created in Iraq. We see a million to two million dead, never mind all the maimed uh, that are fitting into that category as well. It is a horrendous situation. Let us not forget that there was no Al-Qaeda. ISIS didn't exist at that point, but back in 2003 there was no Al-Qaeda in Iraq because Saddam Hussein would have killed them if they were there. What's happened since? Oh, well, I guess, you know, Al-Qaeda moved into Iraq and then ISIS uh, became its next incarnation of the same thing and uh, Al Nusra Front and others. That's not an accident either, because that fits perfectly in line with Odi Dinan's strategy for the 1980s. I don't like it. I, it irritates me when I hear so-called experts and political commentators talking about America not learning its mistakes. Th these aren't mistakes. Some of the objectives are not achieved, uh, but for the most part, the objectives are indeed achieved under the guise of it being a mistake, when we need to recognize it's not a mistake, it's intentional. Some of the things that, uh, that make the impunity that uh, the, the empire and Israel uh, is able to exhibit is exemplified by the hideousness of depleted uranium. Now, this is a subject that is very close to my heart because I served in the first Gulf War as a U.S. Marine. I know, pretty stupid, but nonetheless, that's what I did. And uh, they used depleted uranium. We used depleted uranium in that area. I know this because I have, uh, like anybody who's paying attention, done enough research and I was there. And I've also seen the direct result, which you'll see in this film. And get ready, uh, if you're a little bit soft uh, to um, graphic images, uh, you're going to find it hard to look at these DU babies because they don't even look human, really. Uh, they're, com they're mutants, quite frankly. Their DNA has been completely tinkered with by the radiation of nuclear waste, which is DU. And I have actually traveled in 2003. I traveled just before the invasion to the Children's Hospital in Basra where the, the majority of this depleted uranium was used. And this is in, two, and this is in 1991, this isn't even 2003 and, and beyond, because we dropped probably 10 times, maybe even 100 times more DU then. So even with this much smaller amount of DU in, in the Basra area, I went to the Children's Hospital, uh, and, and I was able to see the photo albums. And they had, I don't know, there was at least five, six, seven photo albums, thick ones, and uh, in these photo albums were the, all the pictures of, of these mutants, you know, it, it, it's, it's tragic, you know, you can't even really call them babies, you know, they're, they're, they're no longer uh, a proper human baby, you know, and, and most of them are stillborn, or if they're born that way, uh, they're not going to live long, and, and you can imagine the trauma that is created to the mother, and to the father and the stigma, stigma that is attached to the women who have these babies. In fact, it is so much worse now in the 2003 invasion that in Fallujah, where we didn't just use depleted uranium, but all sorts of other experimental weapons, white phosphorus, and all sorts of chemical compounds, it is so bad in Fallujah that doctors are actually advising women to not have babies because the birth rate defect uh, the, the, the rate of birth defects and genetic damage from all of these experimental and chemical agents, including depleted uranium, are so extreme that it is causing it, it, it to be impossible to even consider having a healthy child. That is how bad it is. Now, if that's not a crime against humanity, I don't know what is, because let's break this down here. Depleted uranium is, is 
In fact, nuclear waste, something that used to cost a lot of money to be able to dispose of and was a liability for the nuclear producers, has now been turned into a weapon because it pierces lead and armor and things like this. Now we simply get rid of our nuclear waste in the form of DU rounds, and we get to distribute it all over the countries we really don't like, which means DU fragments uh, are created by the heat and blast uh, of the rounds hitting their intended target. And, and one of the interesting things to note is that that DU dust, which has a half-life of billions of years, eventually that dust is so light that it can be lifted up by winds, taken up into the upper uh, stratosphere, and then delivered to other parts of the globe. So basically the whole world has some level of DU uh, transporting around on every corner of the planet. It makes you wonder maybe if the powers that be are from another planet that might be full of radioactivity and maybe that's good for them. Maybe they enjoy that sort of thing. I don't know, but it, it's hard to explain if these individuals who are running the world apparently uh, want to continue living here and have children here because their children are going to breathe this crap in too, aren't they? Maybe they don't come from here. I don't know. But these people are not humans in terms of their humanity. They have no humanity, and using DU is a crime against humanity. And there are no convictions at the International Criminal Court, which has been turned into an institution to uh, incriminate and prosecute Africans uh, and basically leave all of the imperial agents completely alone. That's why Tony Blair and George Bush are not sitting in a jail cell for the rest of their lives, which would be merciful considering their role in the mass murder, war crimes and crimes against humanity and torture that has been carried out as a result of these policies. So in, in, in the current context, uh, you know, we look at all these things that are happening, we look at impunity, and in the nuclear age, what we can see is that if we carry on this way, it's pretty much inevitable that we're going to have, at some point, some sort of nuclear launch. And if that sets off a chain reaction, well, that's it now, isn't it? That's it. Game over. End of story. And we're still allowing this. I mean, as people, I don't understand why we aren't all insisting. Now, it's time to get rid of nuclear weapons. In the United States, first and foremost, since it has the largest stockpile and uses more weapons of mass destruction and has actually used atomic bombs twice on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it's the United States that needs to disarm. In fact, all nations that are the higher users and producers of weapons of mass destruction are the ones that need to disarm. It isn't Iraq, it isn't Libya, it isn't Afghanistan, it isn't any of these countries. It's the United States, Britain, Israel, Russia, China, all the big ones that have all the weapons, in particular nuclear weapons. Let's not forget Israel's two to 400 nuclear weapons and their, uh, and their ability to carry out what's known as the Samson option. These are all very dangerous things, and I get into the Samson option in uh, this program as well. So... The other last thing I want to bring up is this Armageddon agenda that we see here. Now, obviously, Christians believe that until, until Armageddon uh, occurs, the second coming of Christ is not possible. So, unfortunately, there are a lot of Christians out there who don't realize that by seeking or wanting Armageddon, which is really synonymous with World War III, uh, you know, they're banking on Jesus Christ coming uh, at the advent of World War III and saving us all. Now, uh, you know, that would be nice. But that's what's called the Savior program. You know, I, I mean, are we seriously, are we at that place where we're going to wait for the Savior? I, I mean, do we even deserve it? We have to wait for the second coming of Jesus Christ to save us? That's pretty pathetic, given that God gave us free will. You Christians believe in free will. You also believe, uh, if you believe in Jesus Christ, but unfortunately a lot of you Christians don't know a damn thing about Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus Christ wasn't for bombing nations. What country would Jesus bomb? That's always my question to the so-called Christians out there. Why don't you learn a little bit more about Jesus Christ? The Armageddon agenda is extremely dangerous, and we should not fall prey to it. And while I'd be happy as anybody else to see the second coming of Christ, especially if he's going to do great service to all of us, but I am not happy to experience World War III or encourage World War III in order to encourage the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's a very dangerous manipulation at play, and we really do need to recognize that. In the first program, we identified an important connection between the Israeli attacks on the U.S. Navy ship Liberty in 1967 and the humanitarian aid ship Mavi Marmara in 2010. What connects these two events is the impunity that allows humanity's worst criminals to get away with the worst crimes imaginable. The end result of this madness is the utter uselessness of international law. In this program, we consult four international law experts and investigate the reasons why international law is failing humanity, and more importantly, the solutions required to ensure that international law finally serves humanity.
life goes on, or so we say. With the overwhelming success of the human species in exploring and populating every corner of this planet, it can be somewhat reasonably understood why so many human beings appear to believe that we as a species are invincible. The fact that human beings carry on with life as if there did not exist the very real threat of nuclear annihilation says a lot about our mental state as a whole. Under sane and healthy circumstances, there can be no doubt that we as a species would be adamant about eliminating any legitimate threat to life on Earth, and yet, we carry on in denial and pretend the current state of affairs is acceptable. The reality, however, is that the current state of affairs is anything but acceptable. Humanity has indeed come to the brink of total self-destruction on numerous occasions, and there exist today extremely combustible elements that combined could very well result in global thermal nuclear war. Case in point, the Samson option. The Samson option is a reference to the biblical character Samson, who killed himself and thousands of his enemies by pushing apart the pillars of a Philistine temple. This biblical suicide mission has found its way into the highest levels of Israeli strategy right here in the 21st century. What this translates to is top-level Israeli officials backing a modern strategy of deterrence that has at its core an open threat to the world that Israel will use massive retaliation with nuclear weapons if it feels its existence is threatened. Effectively, the Samson option is Israel's threat of a global nuclear suicide bombing. Aside from Israel, Pakistan, Russia, the United Kingdom, France, and the United States have all declared their willingness to use nuclear weapons against nuclear and non-nuclear states in a defensive move or in a first strike capacity. Add to this the clear history of false flag operations in which national governments murder and maim their own people in order to launch war and we see that the current state of affairs is a genuine threat to ourselves, our children and future generations. It is my belief that the key to ending this madness is to transform international law into what it should have been from the very beginning a means of deterring humanity's worst crimes by ensuring the instigators of such crimes are punished swiftly and severely. With this understanding, I spoke with international law experts from the Netherlands, Turkey, Bangladesh, Belgium and South Africa. Each of these experts is actively involved in high-profile cases and their collective knowledge provides lucid insights into the failed system of international law we know today. At the time of the creation of the International Criminal Court, it was a very big hope because finally, after years of discussions, after some uh, international courts created ad hoc for uh, big crimes like Yugoslavia, Rwanda, we finally had an International Criminal Court which was competent for the most biggest and horrible crimes, genocide, war crimes and crimes against humanity. Uh, very big hope to say finally we have the, the good tool to fight against injustice in this world. The International Criminal Court is down in session. On July 1st, 2002, the International Criminal Court, or ICC, was founded. The stated purpose of the court was to prosecute individuals responsible for committing humanity's greatest crimes, crimes such as genocide, war crimes and crimes against humanity. I remember the day the ICC was founded very well. I was an American refugee seeking political asylum here in Holland, and ultimately my understanding of the need for international law was extremely strong. On the day the court was founded, I burned my U.S. passport here at the U.S. consulate in Amsterdam. I did so in protest of U.S. crimes against humanity for the use of depleted uranium, or DU, DU is in fact nuclear waste that's been weaponized and it produces the most hideous birth defects imaginable. Effects that are 100% predictable and thus premeditated. My hope was that raising awareness about DU along with the promotion of the ICC would help prevent the pending invasion and occupation of Iraq. 11 years on, my birth nation America along with its closest allies Israel and Britain have continued their legacy of impunity by carrying out torture and wars of aggression on a massive scale. In addition, 
Countless crimes against humanity have been committed by using DU, white phosphorus, cluster bombs, napalm, drone strikes, and experimental weapons against military and civilian targets in Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, Yemen, Lebanon, Gaza, and Libya. Subsequently, millions of refugees are roaming this planet, millions of children have been made to be orphans, and millions more maimed and murdered. All of this done in the name of the so-called War on Terror, a farce and an insult to our intelligence. And not one Western official has been prosecuted, much less convicted, at the International Criminal Court. Which really begs the question, what exactly is the purpose of the International Criminal Court, or indeed international law itself? The, the purpose of the International Criminal Court is stated fairly clearly in the preamble to the statute of the court, setting up the court, and it is to uh, ensure that there is prosecution of international crimes and that there will be no impunity for international crimes. That is the overriding purpose. Impunity feeds the next crime. Uh, because responsibles of crimes against humanity, if they just are free of movement and free of handling like this, nothing stops them. I must say, I'm not satisfied with the performance of International Criminal Court because so many violations of international law uh, is going on worldwide. So, so many people are being killed. Crimes against humanity is being committed worldwide, but without any remedy. We see that the court is not functioning as it should be. Our reason for this is that there is too much political pressure on the International Criminal Court by several countries. In my opinion, the uh, United States of America is trying to establish some sort of domestic course which will be more effective for them. But the international, if the International Criminal Court is uh, effective, then it may cause some problem to them because uh, uh, in committing crimes against humanity worldwide, they may be involved, their people may be involved. So that will be embarrassing for them. And that's why they're trying not to make effective the International Criminal Court. We see that at the moment, the ongoing cases at the International Criminal Court uh, are prosecutions on individuals from African countries only. If any individual from any other nation would have been prosecuted and convicted in the court, I believe this would give a very strong signal to individuals from countries who believe that they are above the law. Uh, the International Criminal Court, when we analyze the files which are pending now in front of this court, they are all African files, so it's in fact an African criminal court in case of an international criminal court. The other factor which is very important is that at present there's a standoff between the International Criminal Court and the African Union because all the cases that are present before the court affect, involve Africa. And the African Union has complained that the court is uh, displaying an anti-African bias. The scope of the court is limited because of the fact that it only extends its jurisdiction to state parties. It only has competence to hear cases, to try cases that were committed on the territory of a state party or by a national of a state party. So that means that nationals of the rogue states or crimes that were committed in one of the rogue states uh, are not covered by the International Criminal Court, and that's an unfortunate feature. So in essence, is it fair to say that uh, the flaw of the International Criminal Court is that the criminals, or potential criminals, can simply opt out and say that I don't consent to jurisdiction over me? Is that a fair enough conclusion? Well, the greatest flaw is the lack of jurisdiction over non-signatory states. But within the system itself, I think the greatest flaw is the fact that tremendous power is vested in the prosecutor, but the prosecutor himself or herself is subject to political pressure. And so we saw in the case of Mr. Ocampo that he was very uh, susceptible to uh, pressure, I think particularly from the United States and from the European states, and the present prosecutor has inherited that legacy. The solemn undertaking of the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court 
has hereby been concluded in accordance with the Article 45 of the Rome Statute. On April 21, 2003, Luis Marino Ocampo was elected to the position of Chief Prosecutor of the ICC for a period of nine years. If convicted, Tomás Lubanga's sentence will send a clear message. The era of impunity is ending. It is stunning to note that Ocampo's nine-year tenure at the ICC from 2003 to 2012 coincided almost perfectly with the invasion and occupation of Iraq. It is stunning because of Ocampo's noteworthy capacity to shield those responsible for the decimation of Iraq from prosecution at the ICC. It is also worth noting that one of the primary precursors to the formation of the ICC was the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg, in which 10 German Nazis were ultimately sentenced to death and hanged. Very few seem to remember that of all the crimes Nazi Germany was accused of at Nuremberg, one crime above all others was acknowledged as supreme, and that was the crime of waging aggressive war, war in which no legitimate case for self-defense can be made. The written judgment of the Nuremberg Tribunal referred to wars of aggression as follows, and I quote, To initiate a war of aggression is not only an international crime, it is the supreme international crime, differing only from other war crimes in that it contains within itself the accumulated evil of the whole. Two years later, Iraq was invaded on the pretext of possessing weapons of mass destruction. Indeed, all that has happened in Iraq is a direct result of the war of aggression waged against it by Western powers. So when we look at the results of the invasion and occupation of Iraq, the millions of orphans created, the millions of refugees, the proliferation of the Al-Qaeda brand of terrorism and the collapse of Iraq's national security, the decimation of Iraq's infrastructure and the inescapable suffering of innocent civilians, the millions of men, women and children maimed and murdered, the traumatization of virtually everyone in Iraq and effectively turning Iraq back to the Stone Age. All of this stems from the international act of aggression led by Western powers who were never threatened by Iraq. Add to that the fact that the invasion was sold to the Western public based on a publicly acknowledged pack of lies, and you come to see the invasion of Iraq for what it is, the greatest crime of the 21st century. And yet, not one case has been prosecuted by the ICC. That will be Luis Marino Ocampo's legacy, a man who protected the worst criminals of our time. What is clear from Ocampo's example is that we as people cannot allow a single individual to decide whether justice is to be applied or not. War criminals cannot be allowed to be protected by politically weak and or corrupt individuals. This power must be controlled and maintained by the will of the people of the world. We clearly see extremely strong evidence for war crimes in Iraq, for instance, both on behalf of Britain, which is a party to the ICC, yes. and the United States, which isn't, and yet neither one of these nations have been brought to task. We can understand, based on what you just said, that the U.S. wouldn't be, but what about Britain? Why is Britain not facing war crimes charges? An attempt was made to uh, bring the United Kingdom before the ICC in respect of the uh, behavior uh, conduct of uh, its soldiers in Iraq. And the prosecutor of the uh, International Criminal Court, uh, Mr. Luis Moreno Ocampo, took the view that these uh, crimes were not sufficiently serious to warrant uh, exercising jurisdiction, that they failed on grounds of what he termed the test of gravity. And that is a decision which has been much criticized, but it does indicate the extent to which the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court uh, is responsible for the decisions of the court. So we know that the ICC has been perverted by controlling the chief prosecutor. We know that under current applications of international law, the ICC does not have jurisdiction over non-signatory states like the United States or Israel. We also know that the ICC has been used as a tool to punish Africans while protecting Western war criminals. 
These are serious problems that must be corrected if we are to expect international law to actually serve as an effective deterrent against the worst crimes humanity has to offer. So the next question becomes, what are the solutions? I think their jurisdictions must be much wider and uh, their investigation team should act properly because uh, in a violation of international criminal law, somebody has to file complaint to them and uh, in, in just scrutinizing the complaint, they are taking so much time. So they should expand their, their uh, investigating agencies. I think we need a proactive public prosecutor. The court is built like this that the public prosecutor has uh, an active role of starting the cases. Um, and so he's, he is, in fact, the, the main person because it depends on him if a case can continue, if he presents it to the uh, preliminary chamber for an inquiry or not. Uh, so I think this is the first point. The second point is that we have a, a uh, Security Council at the United Nations, which is completely blocked by the veto system. And that a, a case can be submitted by the uh, Security Council of the United Nations. They can seize the International Criminal Court to say, you take this case and you start an inquiry. We have seen it with the problem of Sudan. But it's apparently more easy to agree with the five permanent members about Sudan than about Israel, of course, because like for everything which concerns Israel, we face the veto of the United States. To keep the world peaceful, there must be a forum for justice. There must be a system so that the people, the perpetrators who are, committed, who are committing the crimes against humanity repeatedly, they must be put into justice. If you see that your government is not working properly, if you see that international institutions are not working properly, <clears throat> you can take action yourself. We should not think that individuals do not have any power. We do have. If Israel and, for instance, the United States were actually brought to task in front of the International Criminal Court, do you think that this would have a significant impact? I think it would have a major impact. Indeed, even if there was no conviction, the mere fact that Israelis were being brought before an international criminal tribunal would send out a very powerful message to Israel and to the United States that Israel is not beyond the reach of international criminal justice. Because for the past 20 or 30 years, Israel quite understandably has uh, been led to believe that it is not subject to the rules of international uh, law. Even just the warrant of arrest would be a very big signal to say impunity, it's over. Only the bringing of perpetrators to justice, that is the solution, I think, that, that can bring peace. What reforms do you think are necessary in order for the ICC to function properly? I think the problem with the International Criminal Court is that it has no jurisdiction over non-state parties and it's very difficult to uh, see a situation in which certain states ever become a party to the Rome Statute, such as the United States and Russian Federation and Israel and Iran, etc. Uh, but there are other ways in which uh, international criminal justice can be achieved and that is by what is known as the uh, institution of universal uh, jurisdiction in terms of which domestic courts may exercise jurisdiction over persons responsible for committing international crimes anywhere in the world. Fittingly, we've come here to the International Criminal Court at The Hague, recalling that this court was set up to prevent the worst of crimes. Despite this, this court has been corrupted. It's been politicized and thus it is ineffective, unless of course you're an African nation. Let us also recall the 20th century, the bloodiest century in the history of humankind, World War I, World War II, culminating in Hiroshima and Nagasaki in which it made very clear to the entire world that we cannot allow a third world war. The United Nations was born in that context and the United Nations from the beginning was also corrupted 
and politicized and has not served the interests of the people and has allowed for time and time again the course of justice to be perverted because of the five permanent member veto status. That system must end. It must be reformed. It will not allow for justice in this world and ultimately it is the height of insanity that we as human beings have allowed ourselves to live in a world in which we're simply one button push away from the end of the world as we know it. We are literally burying our heads in the sand and pretending as if we're not threatening our entire existence. Albert Einstein once said, I know not what weapons World War III will be fought with, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. The gravity of the circumstance could not be any greater. If we get it right, we will have a sane, just, and peaceful world. If we get it wrong, we will end the world as we know it.